Now we know that Prigozhin is back in Russia, and they raided his house, his his palace in in Saint Petersburg. Sure. And what what are they looking for? It seems that it's his case is not going to be over so soon. No, the, the the they're going to expose him. The information that's coming out is not flattering. Uh, it's not making him a more lovable character among the Russian people. Uh, it is co confirming sort of their uh, worst fears about the corruption of an oligarch. So, you know, I don't see it. This is, uh, Prigozhin is just eye candy. He, he's something to distract people away from the real issues of what's going on with the war. So I, I, I don't pay much attention to him. Do you think he's going to get a new contract? No, no, no or, way. No, uh, he's. Uh, let me put it this way: If he gets a new contract, then that will be further evidence that he was actually part of an effort to scam Western intelligence services into believing that he was really intent on committing treason and trying to overthrow uh, the Ministry of Defense. You know, some people point to the fact that there were Russian. Airmen killed in this operation. Well, if look, you can take it in from one perspective that if you're staging um, a drama and it's a, you, you as the leader know it's a fraud, you're not necessarily going to communicate that to your people down the chain of command. And some of them, in their own initiative, may have undertaken to shoot down that those aircraft. Um, and that, you know, the folks who put this together had not anticipated that as a possible outcome. That's just, that's one, one explanation. I'm not saying it's necessarily the truth, but uh, the longer that Prigozhin gets to walk around and not suffer uh, any serious consequences, then the, the more it reinforces for me that he was actually part of this uh, Maskerovka. There, there's some rumors out there that they're talking about these Poles that are going to get more involved in this war in Ukraine. We know that Wagner troops are, are in Be Belarus right now. Yeah, Belarus. It, it's going to have a new front there or they're going to they're gonna continue with this war in Ukraine in, in the same front? Yeah, well, remain, the, the Poles have talked about expanding the war and getting involved directly on the ground. Uh, in uh, Ukraine, along with, um, uh, I believe, Lithuania. So, uh, you know, there's it, there's always that possibility. But talking about it and actually doing it are two different things. Uh, one of the problems they'll face in undertaking such an operation is the devastation that uh, Russia is inflicting on the Ukrainian forces in this current counteroffensive. It is, they're not making any significant gains, no breakthrough of any consequence. Candidly, if they were effective, they would have broken through the third line of defense two weeks ago. They haven't even, Ukrainian troops haven't even reached the first line of defense. So this is just, um, they're, they're throwing themselves up against uh, an impregnable wall and dying in the process. You mean that Poles that they're, they're not able to... To, to, to save the situation for Ukraine. Correct, correct. See. No, no there's, not, there's nothing. What, the Poles can introduce the, their aircraft. Their aircraft are going to get shot down just like the, uh, the Ukrainian aircraft is shot down. How, how capable are our Poles if, if they decide to go fight in Russia? How do you well, see them? If you compare the Poles to uh, the Ukrainian army of a year ago, the Poles are not as competent and capable as the Ukrainian army was a year ago. Interesting. Well, they just, I mean, it was for nothing else, the Ukrainians had more combat experience than the Poles by virtue of the fighting in the, Don, in the Donbass for eight years. On top of that, the training with NATO. Mm -hmm. uh, the Poles have, you know, none of that. So they may look good on paper, but in terms of actual execution, they leave a lot to be desired. And Lukashenko, president of Belarus, he said that that negotiations can start in the fall. 
Do you think that he's sending some sort of codes that this war gonna be over on the part of Russia by fall? Um, I think Russia has the capability to bring it to an end by the fall. Uh, you know, really a lot depends on how far NATO is now willing to go and continuing to support Ukraine. We're already seeing evidence of uh, dissent among NATO ranks, that there is not this great unity, there is great unrest. And um, without continued support from NATO, Ukraine cannot stay in the war. There's some people talk about, oh, it's going to be a stalemate and go on for years. Nonsense. It can't go on for years. They don't have the industrial base, the economic base, the manpower base, the financing to sustain beyond maybe six or eight months. If, they, if the United States and Great Britain cut them off tomorrow, uh, this war would be over in two weeks. Next week, we're going to have a NATO summit. And do you think any anything good coming out of this summit for Ukraine? Any outcome? Uh, no, no. Um, Ukraine wants to get NATO membership. They're not going to get NATO membership. There are too many NATO members that oppose it. I think NATO is going to be dealing with its own internal strife. They want to present a unified face and say, oh, look, we're all, we're all united. But uh, Sweden has created a real problem for itself by virtue of allowing the burning of the Quran. Uh, so Turkey, who has the second largest military force in NATO after the United States, uh, is not very happy. And they're not about to be dictated to by Sweden. So you're going to have that playing as drama along with uh, the lack of progress by Ukraine in doing anything credibly to suggest defeating Russia. They recognize they can't defeat Russia. It's starting to dawn upon many of these leaders. And that realization is going to force uh, a reassessment of the policy. You think that there is no hope for Ukraine getting NATO membership? No, no. They, why why they, they why are they paying lip service to every time they're talking about this? This they think no, Ukraine will be a member of NATO. Why they're doing this? Well, it depends. Certain countries want to keep keep that hope alive, and others are just rejecting it, saying no, that's you know we're not going to allow it. So. And it's not even clear that Na that Ukraine is going to be allowed to attend the, the summit. I mean, that's the other issue that's going on here. You think that the reason they're doing this is because they want to keep this war going? Oh, they'd like to. You know, there's uh, policymakers in the West, in the United States, United Kingdom, Germany, that believe that they can, if they bleed out Russia it will weaken Russia and make the West stronger uh, relative to Russia. I think it's a foolish policy, self-destructive of the West. Europe in particular needs the energy that uh, Russia can supply. And by continuing to reject Russia, uh, the, you know, the setting, they're setting up their own failure in Europe. Uh, the circumstances this coming winter could be very grim and not as you know, much worse than last winter. We see that Ukrainian defense minister in a in an interview with Financial Times, he said that Ukraine is the best testing ground for NATO, for, for, for weapons of Western mm -hmm. allies. What kind of minister is that? Is he well, really Ukrainian? Who's the enemy of Ukrainians? Is the is is Russia or Zelensky administration. Yeah. Now, Zelensky's uh, policies are getting a lot of Ukrainian men killed. Uh, an enormous number, you know, it reminds me a little bit of what happened in Paraguay during the Chaco War. You remember the, you know, significant number of uh, the men were killed. And it, it affected the population growth of that country for, for generations. Um, you know, that was down in your neck of the woods. So, um, you know, I think Ukraine's facing a similar kind of devastation. And it's on a, they've now, I think they just recently had a poll where roughly 
75% of the Ukrainians interviewed knew at least one person who had been killed or wounded in the military conflict. That's so when, when you, you know, it's one thing to say that, whereas, you know, go back to like in the United States during the Vietnam War, it was lucky if 15% of Americans knew one person killed or wounded in that war. But just, this is, uh, this is an enormous number if you've got that many reporting that kind of figure. Larry, there is a riot going on in France that they're talking about this 17 years old guy that they, the policeman killed him. Do you think that this is the problem or the causes of these riots are much deeper than that? I think it's much deeper. I think, you know, it became an excuse to set off the torch. But, uh, you know, the there, there, I think there's some organized crime elements involved in this. Uh, by creating the chaos, it makes it easier for them to operate and exploit the society. You've got weapons from Ukraine that were supposed to go to the Ukrainian army are now showing up in the hands of some of the, uh, the protesters, the rioters, however you want to characterize them. So it is, uh, you know, it's created a real backdrop of chaos in France. And, uh, you know, here's, here's Macron is going to go to the NATO summit and try to put a, you know, paint a happy face on what is really a disaster for him. Do you think that Europe going to keep its support for Ukraine? Just going to last longer? Well, I, I think what's going to happen is you're going to see a, a developing split that will separate the Europeans into two camps. One camp in favor of continued support to Ukraine, uh, the other camp wanting to get out, cut losses and move away. Do you think anything similar coming for London, for Germany? Uh, I Is see there a, any possibility for them? I, I, I think you'll see... Uh, Countries like uh, Bulgaria starting to waver, uh, Turkey definitely wavering, um, the uh, Austria perhaps. So it you know it started it's starting to fray. The bonds of unity that have been touted in the past those are starting to come apart, and uh, I think that process will only accelerate, not decelerate. But. But it, it seems that British government is not going to give up on anything. They're going to, yeah. they want to continue. What, what, this hatred, I, I don't understand. Where does this hatred come from? I, I honestly don't know. Uh, I mean, I've speculated that in part uh, the adamant position of Russia in opposition to homosexuality and uh, there's the strong stance against that. That could be a major reason that people in the United Kingdom and the United States and maybe even Germany are pushing back because they are touting homosexuality as a human right. So that has, that's been a long standing issue of friction between the West and Russia. You know, we saw it come to a head back in the Sochi Olympics in uh, 2012, was that, 2014? Um, so, uh, but beyond that, it's irrational because Russia has not been out invading other countries routinely. Uh, Russia did not invade uh, Afghanistan in the last 30 years. Russia has not invaded Iraq twice in the last 30 years. Uh, uh, you know, so Russia, uh, Russia has, uh, they attacked after, the, they went into Georgia after they were attacked by Georgian forces. But uh, beyond that, Russia has been trying to protect itself at home. Sharp, sharp contrast with the United States. The United States has been running amok over the planet. And, you know, I think part of what we're starting to see is the beginning of a payback as this new world order is created. And uh, even in Brazil, uh, Brazil is taking steps to separate itself from the U.S. dollar and to not be beholden to Washington. And Larry, you see that this when 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 United States went to Afghanistan, 
Russia helped a lot. Right. The, U yeah. the U.S. forces. Could you describe how did Russia help the United States in that war? Well, the United States entered Afghanistan from the northern territories. Uzbekistan, I believe it is, up there. And coming in through that, they had to have the help of the Russians to get in, as well as use Russian helicopters. They were not bringing in American Blackhawks or American Hueys. Uh, they were uh, uh, they were using uh, the Russian Hinds, as an example. So, you know, Russia did a lot, in, uh, both in sharing intelligence, sharing human sources, sharing resources and access. Interesting. But what they get, <laughs> it's a Ukraine war. <laughs> yeah, no, no respect. No respect from the United States. <laughs> And, you know, the United States, uh, the, the, the Russians were much smarter with how they handled Afghanistan. They were in Afghanistan essentially for nine years and then recognized, you know, we can't continue to stay in here and prop up this government. So they, re they had an orderly withdrawal. There was no, you didn't have any images of people clinging to airplanes and then dropping uh, from the sky to their death, like you did with the United States. You had people waving, celebrating banners as the Russians pulled out. The exact opposite to what happened when the United States left Afghanistan. Larry, is there any sign in the U.S., in the Biden administration, that they're going to be willing to negotiate with Russia in Ukraine? No, I no, know. none, none. We're, there are reports out now that uh, some of the more prominent neoconservatives uh, and the former head of the Council of Foreign Relations, Richard Haas, have uh, made openings and treaties to Russia and are trying to see if they can broker a negotiated solution. But even those people, their message is coming back. They're being rejected by the Biden administration. So um, the, the Biden team so far shows no urge to back off for negotiation. In fact, they're doubling down on violence. They're saying they're now sending um, cluster bombs, which have a high, high uh, probability of killing civilians. And you know, it's it's really uh, it's can be considered a war crime, in my view, to send those. Biden administration is a miss, missing a beach. They're sending it. I see. Thank you so much, Larry, for being with us today. Nima, always a pleasure. It's always a pleasure to have you on.